You know, I'm a naturalist. I don't believe in God. But I think there is a good karma with the odontoid fractures. Just imagine if the funnel at the level of the odontoid was at the level of C5, C6. There would be no patient to treat because the mortality rate is so high in this, uh, in this patient. In fact, um, so um, I was looking at uh, literature and uh, uh, Jim Harrop has a paper that of 2,749 patients, there were only 17 patients with odontate fracture and cervical spinal cord injury. I looked at the shock from for the past 20 years from 2,176 patients with spinal cord injury, only 58 patients, they had uh, odontate fractures. So why, I, I was thinking what is the best thing, what's, what's the best message for you to give you here? I thought about 15 to 20% of, of the cervical spine fractures are at the level of the odontate. But why only 0.6% they have a spinal cord injury? Jim Harrop did a calculation at the level of the odontate process, and he found out that the AP diameter and the surface area at this level in patients with odontate fractures is lower than normal. So, that's one of the reasons that they have spinal cord injury. Now, um, another peculiar phenomenon is that I looked at the complete spinal cord injuries and incomplete spinal cord injuries at the level of the odontoid and at the level of the subaxial cervical spine injuries. It's about equal. Well, with, with a few percentage up or down, uh, about in the subaxial injuries, 50% of all the injuries, they are complete, and 50% are incomplete. Top on the agenda is acute traumatic central cord syndrome. When we looked at our numbers of the uh, 58 patients, uh, it's still 55 55% of the patients with AISA or being in coma they are um, at the level of the um, odontate. And again, 54% of the rest of the incomplete spinal cord injuries, they are acute traumatic spinal, acute central cord syndrome. So, but then you look at the patients that survive, you see the acute care mortality in subaxial spinal cord injuries is about 10% to 15%. But at the level of the odontate process, about 50%, which makes no sense. So why is that so? Um, so you have this patient with uh, unilateral lock facet, still is living. And you see that lady who, um, let me see if I can. I just want to uh, click on this one. This is a video. How can I make it work? This lady is a... So this is a lady who is not unusual at the shock. They come in with odontate fracture, they are in coma, and they have facial myoclonus, and they eventually, they expire. Why is that so? So um, now, if we look at a couple of things over here, is that if you look at the intramedullary lesion length at this region, we see they are very close to the lateral reticular formation, lateral medullary reticular formation, where is the cardiac and respiratory center. And then look at this over here, the corticospinal tract towards the um, corticospinal tract uh, to the diaphragmatic 
uh, anterior horn cells also passes through this region. So when you have a complete spinal cord injury, AISA, you just cause two problems. One of them is that you beat the shit out of lateral ventricular liclose, start stimulating itself, and it's going to go. So you have the uh, you have the vagus, which comes from the lateral aspect of the medulla. Vagus goes and causes bradyarrhythmias immediately. So these patients, they have uh, bradyarrhythmias. The heart stops. You have loss of complete sympathetic nervous system that d drops the blood pressure. And at the same time, you have, um, uh, you have a drop in blood pressure. You have cardiorespiratory arrest. And these patients die. At the same time, the patient doesn't have any diaph diaphragm. So diaphragm is paralyzed. The patient has pentaplegia. They call it pentaplegia. The patient is not only quadriplegic, diaphragm starts working. The patient develops bradyarrhythmias. And also, at the same time, the blood pressure drops. And these patients come in, in with anoxic encephalopathy. So the corticospinal tract towards the diaphragm nucleus is cut. And if you look at the patients with incomplete spinal cord injury, you see that uh, previously they, they called it cruciate uh, paralysis, but in fact, they are acute traumatic central cord syndrome. So 50% or more of the incomplete spinal cord injuries, they are acute traumatic central cord syndrome. And they stay alive, and they go home, and they, and, and they do very well, just like the acute traumatic central cord syndrome in the subaxial cervical spinal cord injuries. Why is that so? So we discussed, uh, you know, John discussed the acute traumatic central cord syndrome uh, this morning by Dr. Schneider and, uh, and his group. And previously, they thought, that, OK, corticospinal tract has a function which is more appropriate for the upper extremities medially and laterally is more appropriate for the lower extremities. Therefore, the upper extremities are involved more than the lower extremities. However, this, is, this has been challenged by Paul Sibusi and, and, uh, and Dr. Sontag. Paul Sibusi followed the um, the corticospinal tracts up to the cerebral pedicle, the topography of an organization is very is comes up to the, um, the cruciate uh, up to the cerebri where there is there is arms and there is legs arms in front and legs in the back. Beyond this, corticospinal tract completely is mixed together, because when Sontag they injected horseradish pro proxidase. Uh, over the cortex, and they followed the fibers coming down at the level of the uh, pyramid of the uh, upper pyramid of the cervical spine. The corticospinal tracts are completely uh, mixed together. So this uh, gave a uh, theory by um, uh, Charles Tatter and Levy that the reason that upper extremities are more involved than the lower extremities is because God gave us more than 95% of the fibers coming through the corticospinal tract, they involve with the upper extremities. In fact, with the fingers and hand function. That's how God made us. That's why our, um, our, our hands are involved. So this is the patient with uh, cervical spinal cord injury. You see the uh, small syrinx, central, central cord syndrome. And this is a... Um, uh, a patient that uh, was called previously cruciate paralysis reported by Wallenberg. And again, the same thing as acute central cord syndrome. So that's the end of my lecture. So what is the message? The message is that patients with patients usually do not have involvement of the cervical spinal cord at the level of the odontoid because the funnel is white. And Jim Harrop said that those patients that they had cervical spinal cord injury, the funnel was narrower. If they get involved, 
wherever they are, they should be massively resuscitated to prevent cardiorespiratory uh, res uh, uh, failure and dying right on the spot. Thank you. John, thank you. Any follow-up questions? It's, it's a very, very uh, compelling lecture. Yet again, I'm so uh, grateful for all these great uh, physiologic insights, uh, expanding our knowledge of spinal cord injury. For me, the biggest problem patients are the older lady that you showed, these elderly patients who may or may not have had a chronic myelopathy and fall, and then they have a state of dementia predating uh, this catastrophic fall. Ground level falls are, by the way, a leading cause of death now in the US. And then we have this mess of catastrophic decision-making compressed into a couple of critical hours. Do we or do we not try to do some salvage surgery, aside from all the physiologic catastrophes that are unfolding? I guess in the, in the third lecture, I'm going to give some insights. Thank you. Look forward to it. Thank you. <laughs>